Okay, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar today. My name is Albert Baker. We're here to talk about indoor and outdoor location one data set. So I'm here from the Donato side. We also have Peter from the CEO side, but what we're really interested in talking about today are those real life use cases for location, tracking, navigation, positioning, those use cases that the enterprise and industry need to change their business. So we're going to do a live demo. We're going to actually show you two different platforms. We're going to show you commissioning using a mobile app, using some real tags here with us today. So it's not uh, death by PowerPoint, but there are some slides just to give you a backdrop. Okay, so um, I'm co-founder of Donalto. We're an Irish company. We're coming from Dublin, Ireland today. I've got Pat McGowan here with me too. He's based in Michigan. Uh, he's an industry expert. He'll be able to give you some context on why people need these solutions to track their things and people. And we're delighted to have Suyo uh, with us today, including Peter, um, who's able to show you some of the technology, the, high ac the uh, highly accurate technology that's actually used today is using ultra wideband. Um, but we're going to actually kick off just with a poll. So we wanted to just gauge from the people who are here today about uh, the driver for these types of solutions in business. So if you can click your answer when you have a moment. There is a prize, but you have to wait until the very end to find out what it is. Okay, so for you, what is the biggest driver for locating and tracking in the enterprise? Safety of personnel, waste of time, lost or misplaced assets, compliance, lost productivity, or timely completion, of projects. Okay, we've got a tie for second place, which is waste of time and loss or misplaced assets. But safety of personnel is one out there pretty convincingly. So I wonder, is it because it was the first on the list? So thanks for that. Um, it's always great to understand what's in people's heads when we talk about this technology. But I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Pat, who'll talk about um, some of the information we have about why people use these systems. Uh, thank you, Albert, and welcome, everybody. Uh... I, again, my name is Pat McGowan. Um, I'm located here in the United States and uh, just outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, some of the things that I want to talk to uh, everybody about today is uh, trends in the industry and historical perspective. Uh, this uh, table 4.1 that you're going to see right here, uh, this is from a Construction Industry Institute, CII, a workshop that was done over 10 years ago. And the interesting part is, is the problems haven't changed. Um, technology is uh, being embraced and it's correcting these problems. But one of the things that we found in there, uh, the study on the RT240 study was uh, misplaced materials, timeliness, what have you. And we had um, a variety of universities, University of uh, Texas, Austin, University of Waterloo, Ontario, University of Cincinnati, um, Alberta, there was a university there and then we had all these PhD candidates and Six Sigma people working on this. So it was uh, a very objective point of view, but if you look at the results, uh, the time that was spent on being able to reduce searching, which was their biggest problem in the industry, it went from 18 hours to 20 minutes. Uh, the second, uh, or excuse me, case three is two hours to five minutes, one hour to five minutes, three hours to six minutes, two hours to three minutes. And essentially what happened is the, the biggest problem that everybody was running into is the receipt of materials on a project, whether it was a construction project, uh, for energy or, uh, you know, infrastructure roads or what have you to nuclear energy to manufacturing is, is where is the stuff that I need to do my job? Um, this, you know, the when, where, and why of this is when this is happening every day across the board. And the interesting part is, is that 
it is a, a global situation and when people can't find the materials it's uh it, it has a crippling ripple effect that not only are you sending multiple people to go out and find something because you can't locate it in the workspace it's the two to three individuals that you send out there looking for but the ripple effect is is that you have craft labor sitting on the other side of that equation and they can't do their job until they receive the material so you know one of the things is is that multiple projects around the world are suffering from uh, a lot of high valued uh, pre-engineered products that uh, are in the supply chain that are supposed to be received and one of the things that we're going to be able to arrest is, is by identifying these components upstream or downstream so meaning that if we're they're being manufactured that we can actually put the technology on it and track it to the site inspect it um, look for a damage on the product receive it give it a location whether it's indoor and outdoor and it's really important that i stress the indoor and outdoor um Denalto is one of the few companies around that can actually transition and locations of materials from indoors to outdoors and then back in again um the ripple effect again you got labor there but the other side of it is is that you can actually trigger event to if something's not there uh does that go to procurement so they can reorder or do they find out that it was lost in shipment so there's a lot of uh, predictability that we can pick up in these models and improve uh, the timeliness the delivery of a project and making sure that the workers are being productive okay albert the indoor and outdoor use cases um you know for tracking workers and worker safety that's a primary goal in every company that we're engaged with and it is pretty much primary goal for every company that's out there right now your number one asset is your worker whether they're direct or indirect so it's common that we want to know where the workers are uh, did they arrive on site are they going into the work phase we also want to know in the case of a, a director indirect that if it's an indirect contract labor subcontractor type labor do they have a, a valid work permit do they have valid work orders that they're working under uh did that order or purchase order elapse two weeks ago it needs to get reinitialized so you can control your costs by making sure that the people are on site have the valid credentials and work papers to continue uh, and you're not just writing checks to people that aren't supposed to be there the other thing is is the enhanced safety is locating people in the work site and let's say albert and peter and i go out to uh, the tool room and we're going to get fall restraint harnesses with the uh, use of these types of systems you can find out that Peter and Albert have current safety certifications for a fall restraint harness. Mine actually expired, so I need to get recertified. So what you're doing is removing the opportunity for a worker to get a tool or otherwise that he is not uh, able or uh, can't use because he doesn't have the certifications or credentials. That could be from fall restraint harnesses to breathing apparatus for enclosed areas to you know welders or heavy equipment. Um, the e-mustering portion of this situation is very important because in uh, workspaces, especially when you're working down in construction sites, oils, gas, mining, nuclear, what have you, when inclement weather happens, you want to be able to do a muster and be able to locate all the workers, put them in a safe zone, make sure that everybody's accounted for. So this is something that's very crucial, uh, that e-mustering is is something that uh, is critical and the insurance side of all of the projects that you're working on uh, once you identify to your insurance carrier that you actually have this you'll get a reduction typically in your insurance premiums because they're looking out for worker safety uh, primarily first and foremost the geofencing actually ties into this very nicely because when you're outside in a work area or even inside in a manufacturing facility uh, we can cordon off uh, areas electronically to make sure that you don't go in an area that is hazardous or uh, that requires security clearance or what have you. The other side of it is, is that the uh, this solution uh, lends itself to immediate action. So if you had a, a chemical spill or a dangerous environment that just raised itself in an outdoor workspace, 
in a matter of seconds, you can actually geofence the area, cordon it off, and you can alert all the workers that are in the area that as they get close to it, an alarm's gonna sound on their badging and keeping them uh, in the safe areas and out of harm's way. You know, on the supply chain, the upstream and downstream is pretty interesting because there's a lot of work that happens where uh, pieces are fabricated off site. So you want to be able to make, make sure that the things that are being fabricated are going through all the quality checkpoints and toll gates. Uh, they're inspected properly. They're put on into a shipment that we can track the shipment and then keep it moving out to the site. We can uh, then inspect it when it gets to site. Uh, this is the secure chain of custody. Uh, the predictability model speaks to itself because if we get early on uh, notification that these things didn't make the shipment, we can readjust all of the labor on the other side of it. So we don't have people standing around at a high cost. Uh, again, all of these things are based upon giving you a return on investment. Um, all of these things eventually will pay for themselves and increase productivity and certainly the increased safety of a worker on site is primary and um, we can't append the cost of what it uh, means to keep a person safe at all times. You know, our job is to make sure that they go home at night. You know, the improved business operations, uh, our goal is also on top of everything else I spoke of is to keep the project on schedule on time and on budget. Uh, one of the biggest runaway costs is labor all the time. And if I can track the labor and get people hands-on equipment and materials uh, in a timely fashion, uh, that's gonna report to the bottom line pretty much immediately. Albert, for the next one. The asset pathfinder is a really interesting application because now that I've identified all these components, where are they outside? The Cardinal product will actually give you a, a pathway to everything outside matter of fact it'll go inside as well so you're not wandering around looking for it uh it gives you the ability to find the uh the assets in seconds versus minutes and hours as that cii report it said and again it is a, a it is not a no dark spot situation so i can view the assets from uh its manufacturing inception all the way to its use case in a project and then when there's a turnover inside of the project and it can go with the life of the facility that you're operating in for maintenance and operations okay maybe pat just like a real life example so are we talking from fabricator there to holding site to a construction site like what what kind of materials are we talking about here well let's let's say we're building a power plant okay so uh you you would be getting custom made uh valves or gate valves for uh pumping the uh, material through the pipes. And each valve is different. So it has got an ISO drawing, an engineer drawing. It gets built off site. It gets in transit and goes to site. The interesting part is, is you have heterogeneous and homogeneous parts. These would all be considered heterogeneous. They're very unique. You can't substitute one for another. So we wanna make sure that we have a seamless uh, view of that product from when it's built to when it gets on site, because it is crucial that if it's not there, you can actually set the project on its heels that it could take six weeks to build another one. And there is no accommodation for that time loss. Gotcha, gotcha, thanks. This is a, a, a common picture of a lay down yard that's outside. And if you look at that right now, there's literally thousands of pieces of products out there. And if you're looking for something and you can type in it's an ABC123 Bennett gate valve or a piece of structural steel, this is a small lay down yard. We had some of them. Uh, I worked on a project with Bechtel. It was 288 acres of storage. And when you went out to find something, you could literally get lost out there days looking for it. And they relied strictly on using technology to locate each piece. Uh, and depending on how granular you want to get, some of these pieces, you can see the pipes there, they may all be the same pieces of pipe. But the other side of it is if it's a specific pipe, they need to be uniquely identified and we can actually guide you right to the product itself. Yeah, and I think an important point there is the sort of the, the different options, the different blend of technologies, large sites, small right. sites, what accuracy you need. 
Obviously, today we're talking ultra wideband, traditionally used indoors, needs a, you know, a network of anchors. Peter will explain that more. And then outdoors, you've got different options like long range technologies like LoRa. In theory, you want to have a platform which can ingest data from both. So this is an outdoor right. space right. either. And, and that's that's something that's very important is, is that uh, Cardinal lends itself to its integration capabilities with all of these technologies. It's literally a standalone in the global industry of uh, being able to take all of these dissimilar technologies and give you a single pane of glass to present the data to you and that you can actually do your job, but you can also feed other systems that are out there. Yeah. On the eMaster, do you want to go on the eMustering, Albert? Yeah, for sure. So this is, I suppose, a good example, and we'll show it in the live platform of a front end that was that was required for a large uh, chemical processing customer. So outdoor and indoor all covered in one pane of glass. So really what's happening here is in the wider area on, on the refinery or the processing plant, we're using, in fact, we're using Laura 2.4 to track people to make sure they're safe. And as they go into these zones, um, we actually use ultra wideband to make sure in a very accurate way that this person is close to the check-in point to make sure they're counted to make sure they're kept safe. Because obviously e-mustering is all around. Something has gone wrong on the site. We need to make sure people are counted, not uh, unlike a fire drill, for example. So, um, you know, being able to create zones ad hoc, like Pat mentioned, um, oh, excuse me, the real-time updates and the start and stop muster events. And these are some of the um, features that were required for this front end. There happened to be two radios working in the background, ultra wideband and LoRa, but that's, all, that's actually seamless to the user. It's a single dot for a single person. They may be in the wide area or they may be in a little zone and they're gonna get half a meter accuracy or better. Um, so I thought that was a decent example. And then the other one, might, our assets where our pick list is very relevant. So maybe Pat, you're better just to cover that one. Yeah, um, if you're using a system like Autodesk or Aviva or Oracle, Hexagon, a lot of times, uh, well, most of the times, they actually have a material pick list that's uh, done for the project out of procurement. And it comes out of an, uh, an advanced uh, ad advanced work planning or packages system. And so what they're gonna do is they wanna be able to uh, give you a pick list at the beginning of the day as to what products need to be picked so they can go into the work phase. So the craft can actually have the material available and stand it up, weld it in, whatever they need to do. So it's important that we can take that information from said Autodesk type systems and download it into the Cardinal platform and then go out and actually go and look for it, pick them up piece by piece by piece. Uh, we can actually give you a, a walk order or a pick order uh, and some routing capabilities. So we're not backtracking back and forth, we'll take it out there. And you, know, you can see here by zone one, two, three, uh, as to where you know, these pieces are gonna be and you go out there and pick them and then you take them to the work phase. Go ahead. Peter, do you want to take the reins right now? Make sure you're not on mute there, Peter, in case. Ah, is it better now? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Let me finish the round of introductions there. So my name is Peter Sedlacek. And uh, just like the guys, I've been involved in the real-time tracking business for these past few years. My focus has been mainly on the indoor piece, which I'm going to talk about here, and uh, mainly around ultra-wideband technology. We've mostly worked in Sevio with uh, manufacturing and logistics companies. So, you know, mostly in like aerospace, automotive, uh, also CPG industry, and lately also in the metals industry. So I'll just uh, quickly cover some of the use cases and show some examples of, uh, you know, what those applications may look like. Uh, to give you some introduction about the company as well, uh, Savio has been always focused on, you know, the manufacturing and logistics industry. And, you know, our approach is that we always like to understand, you know, customers' application needs in detail, uh, understand and process all the way from receiving to shipping. 
And then, you know, we can kind of suggest or tailor the solution around that, basically. So the idea is that, you know, if you have today, you know, a very capable, you know, WMS system or MES, uh, you know, through our open, open API, you can feed directly into that system. Or we can also then use additional pieces of software applications or technologies uh, to, you know, uh, let's say, focus on specific applications such as, you know, fleet OE or work in progress tracking or safety and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, for a lot of those, we may use, for example, you know, software or solutions from the Nauta. And, you know, I'll show you some of those examples uh, in these slides. So, Zevio's mission is basically to transform manufacturing shop floors to most efficient and safe environments possible through our partners and through the use of location data. That's ultimately the reason why Zevio exists and, and you know where we are mostly focusing today. Uh, most of our clients, as I mentioned, come from the you know automotive and aerospace industries. So you can see some logos there on the bottom of the slide. Uh, you know, general manufacturing, so tier one, tier two suppliers. Um, you know, electrical companies and then distribution centers and warehouses. So all of these types of en uh, environments can benefit quite greatly from location data. Um, at the heart of our products is a technology called ultra wideband. Uh, you know, Albert touched on that already. Uh, those of you who may not be familiar with it as much, it's a technology that allows you to track stuff very precisely indoors, uh, precisely meaning up to one foot level of accuracy. And I would say more about the accuracy, it's about reliability of the location data. Um, because, um, you know, you can have a system running on, let's say, you know, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, which can be, you know, fairly accurate, but that accuracy won't be reliable. What this means is that Envision, you know, if you have a project where, you know, we're tracking something on the automotive assembly line, where you have a lot of moving parts, a lot of metals, and you always have to ensure 20 centimeter accuracy to pair the right tool with the right vehicle. So you cannot have like a single position miscalculated. The same goes to safety project, for instance. Imagine a warehouse where you're tracking, you know, pedestrians and forklifts. And, you know, again, you cannot, you know, afford to have a single, you know, position like calculated wrong. So that's why, you know, for us, ultra wideband is the technology of choice when it comes for indoor tracking, because it allows, you know, to track stuff with six sigma level of reliability. Um, in general, like there are three categories of use cases, I would say that, you know, we focus on with, with the product. First one is, let's say, product tracking. So you can envision, you know, tracking of pallets, kits, totes, you know, any type of product or raw materials that you have on the plant floor. Um, you know, you can use this data to lower buffers, uh, you know, eliminate any searching. I mean, every plant floor that I've probably been to has problems with searching. So, you know, because you know where everything is, this helps you greatly to eliminate that. Uh, then you can use it also to track material handling equipment. So forklifts, pallet jacks, AGVs, uh, you know, AMRs, any types of vehicles that are on the plant floor. And then personnel tracking, mainly for safety purposes, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um to tell you guys a little bit of a background on ultra wide, it's a technology that's been around for quite some time, for more than 15 years now. But uh, the thing is that, you know, back in the day when it started, it was a very proprietary technology. So there was just really like a few companies out there on the market that were actively, um, you know, offering the technology to clients. And as a result, it, only the largest OEMs of the world were actively using the technology. If you fast forward 12 years, you know, until 2019, that's when Apple has introduced, uh, you know, ultra wideband chip into their iPhone 11. And since then, every new Apple product basically has that technology incorporated, including the Apple AirTags, for instance. Um, so, you know, it's becoming like, you know, it's a booming technology also in the consumer world when it comes to uh, indoor applications. On the manufacturing side, we see companies like Siemens, Bosch, Atlas Copco, Torque Tools, uh, Jaguar, Land Rover Cars, all of these, you know, companies are starting to integrate ultra wideband technology into their products. Uh, so all of these companies are, you know, realizing what we did all those years ago that, you know, that accuracy and mainly the reliability of that location data is key. And that's why everybody is incorporating that into their products. So if you look in the next, let's say, three to five years ahead, what you'll see more and more is that ultra wideband will be embedded in a lot of the stuff that you're using on the shop floors today. Um, I mean, even today, you know, a lot of the forklift OEMs are actually using uh, ultra wideband technology in their products. 
Uh, and if you deploy an ultra wideband canopy in your plant floor, you'll be able to automatically pick these up in the future as you get new equipment. So you won't be limited to like just a siloed application. Back in the day, we used to do an application for, let's say, forklift tracking. If you'll have a location canopy, you will be able to do, you will be able to tackle, you know, several different use cases at once. And that way you'll be reusing the same infrastructure uh, to do multiple uh, different applications and use cases at the same time. From a technical perspective, um, you can envision it like this. So you have a set of anchors uh, that you know basically consist of the location canopy. Those are connected directly to the plant floor, and then you can put a tag on whatever uh, whatever you want to track. And uh, you know you can think of UWB as uh, as uh, similarly to Wi-Fi. If you look at Wi-Fi, let's say. 16, 17 years ago, it was like a nice to have technology where you actually had to buy a Wi-Fi dongle for your laptop, you know, able to be, you know, able to connect to a Wi-Fi network. Everything was cabled. And today you don't even question the necessity of, you know, having Wi-Fi in your laptop. Basically, it's become, it's everywhere, you know, and uh, also the plant floors. So in a few years, we will see this happening to UWB, um, you know, in the form of location data. So location data will be absolutely key for manufacturing clients uh, in the next few years to, you know, use that data to optimize their processes and production. Um, you can also avoid, you know, putting tags on every single asset that you want to track. Uh, we can also, you know, we have a way of leveraging existing, you know, barcodes or QR codes that you may be using on a plant floor. And we can use, you know, uh, sensor sets on cam on forklifts, uh, including cameras uh, or RFID readers to be able to read automatically all of your products. So uh, we also have a solution where you don't actually need to put active tags with batteries uh, on these pallets. And that's typically really great in areas where you have like tens of thousands of pallets or skids. Uh, so, you know, you can avoid placing tags on these and you are able to automatically track uh, the vehicles that are actually carrying these around. And now just to tie the story, how this is all connected with Donalto. Uh, so as I mentioned in the beginning, we Savio works with partners and we partner with Donalto when it comes to, uh, you know, processing of the uh, indoor location data and in combination with outdoors. Uh, because ultra wideband is a technology that's been designed for indoor tracking. We typically don't venture outdoors. And, uh, you know, having like a unified, I would say UI or like a unified, you know, software solution where you have the indoor outdoor piece, that's where Donalto comes into play. So through our open API, we can feed the location data from our ultra wideband system directly into the Cardinal platform. And, you know, Albert will speak to that a little bit more later. But, you know, from the data perspective, this is what it looks like. And you don't have to stop there. You can also connect your data, uh, the location data basically into your existing, you know, MES or WMS systems as well for some further, um, you know, for let's say extracting more value uh, out of the location system as well. And now to quickly show you a software demo, just to show you what the platform uh, looks like for the indoor tracking piece. Uh, this is a 100,000 square feet warehouse that you're, that you're seeing here uh, on the slide or on the screen, sorry. And the green markers that you can see on the map, those are the ultra wideband anchors and the green marker that you can see moving around, those are forklifts. Um, Albert already touched on the zones, the virtual geofences. So you can build those uh, in the, you know, indoor tracking system as well. Um, and, you know, these can designate a pallet location, for instance. So in this application for this client, what we're solving is that we're very verifying the picking location for the forklift. So when it comes to make a pick, uh, we use the virtual zone to, uh, you know, make sure that the driver is picking stuff at the correct location. And then the bottom part here, uh, this is actually the outdoor part. So, you know, we have sensors mounted on the lampposts and we are able to seamlessly track, uh, you know, the forklift as it goes from indoors to outdoors. Of course, you know, you may be wondering, you know, how a system like this is deployed. Uh, so I think at Savio, we've done a really good job at, you know, making ultra wideband as easy to deploy as possible. So, you know, we've incorporated a lot of planning tools to be able to analyze the plant floor and exactly, uh, you know, map out, you know, what the infrastructure will look like and what the location coverage will be. So, you know, we can do like a digital twin kind of copy basically of the uh, of the plant floor of the warehouse and do a very precise design uh, of the ultra wideband network and then you know as we seamlessly go outdoors then it will get picked up by additional technologies and you will see all of that combined in the in the cardinal platform and that would be my piece and uh yeah let me hand it back to uh albert thanks peter 
That was fantastic. Um, I'm just going to pull it back here for a second. So, and just the story of ultra wideband, I think that's really interesting, the evolution. And in fact, DecaWave, who were one of the original uh, pioneers of ultra wideband, in fact, Nato has a tie in with DecaWave, and then our chairman is the founder of um, DecaWave originally. And so I think it's kind of important. And what's what's become clear to me is that there are this ecosystem is so broad and there are so many use cases that uh, partnerships are very important. So Donalto on the platform side is uh, very proud to be in partnership with Suyo who have um, some of the best ultra wideband technology out there. So just to kind of recap, you know, on the platform side and you saw the planning tool there in Suyo which helps to kind of set up the network and you can see some data of assets moving around. But what's important on this um, what we've gathered, the information we've gathered from, again, users in the real world. And we're kind of trying to focus on the real world use cases today because it's all great talking about hypothetical use cases, but how do people use these uh, systems? So configurable dashboards, you know, the statistics, the heat maps, the geofencing, the rules, how do I put that together so that I can look at 500 assets or a thousand assets all at sort of, you know, a glance and I can consume that information. I don't want to be looking at 500 dots moving around. So it's very important to be able to configure that front end. Second thing are is APIs. And uh, in fact, Peter and I were talking about a user in the US who actually has their own system. They want to ingest the data from Cardinal, ultra wideband data, and some GNSS data into their system so that it kind of integrates nicely with their um, workflow and how they already consume data. So APIs are very important. Being able to replay data if something went wrong, I want to actually go back and see what happened and why. Um, design and UI is very important to make it easy to use. Security is number one, as it is in all of these IoT use cases. So encrypted data, role-based uh, access control, user encryption, all supported by our, um, so we're hosted on Amazon Web Services and we leverage all of their search, um, certs in that space. And then being able to scale, so we are cloud first. And um, for example, if you have a SUYO deployment that's on-prem, you can, in fact, run a, a piece of code that will get all of that data up to the Cardinal platform quite easily, which is, which is what we did before. So the multi-radio piece is important, being able to have options when we're outdoors, like Pat spoke about a very, very large lay-down yard or an oil refinery, very harsh environment, and then we're in the warehouse. And maybe that happens all on one site. So you need to have at your fingertips ultra wideband, but also possibly some other options for outdoor. Okay, so I've got a Suyo tag on my wrist here. You can probably see it. Nice sleek footprint. And I also have a Suyo anchor. Peter will be able to send you on some information if you just put your contact details uh, in the chat. And what we're going to actually do is we're going to take this Suyo tag with the QR code on it, and we're going to bring it up onto the Cardinal platform from scratch. So this is being done real time, correct? Yeah, so I cheated. I actually recorded a video of this on a smartphone before the video because if I share my screen with my phone on Zoom, it makes it a bit tricky. But oh, okay. uh, thanks for the question, Pat. So this really is about commissioning the tag. You're able to record where the tag was commissioned and onboarded. You're able to take a photo to make sure it was affixed to the asset, for example, correctly. And so that, you know, in these harsh environments, if it stops reporting um, or if it goes quiet, you know, or goes missing, that you know how it was affixed. And then we can put some um, context around the tag. So here I've got my tag. It's going to be subcontractor A, hazardous zone B. So now this tag has been scanned. And you'll see that it said there as I scan the tag with my smartphone that it said the GNSS accuracy was quite low because I'm indoors. So it's estimating where I've done this, but this is where the tag is now going to take over. So we're not going to be using our phone to track ourselves, we're going to be using the tag. So now I'm just going to uh, hop up. Go ahead, Pat. Just to back that question, the real time, that recording, uh, that was the start to finish to how long it takes to do that, correct? That is correct. That and, is and I think that's I think that's really important to point out because in the past, you had to have a laptop, you had to be sitting inside, and it was, you know, there was lethargy attached to this whole thing and trying to get it done. And what you just pointed out in a matter of seconds, you can be 
commissioning uh, an asset via a mobile phone, and you can do it on the fly, whether you're indoor or outdoor. Exactly, yeah. So you can use the phone. I think it, take, it took less than a minute there. Um, actually, what may happen in, in theory is you may have a batch of devices you want to all bring online at uh, one point, which, which would be a group of devices in, in, the platform, in, in, the, in the platform's eyes. So that's also possible. Um, but then it's about putting uh, some data around that tag and how do you associate that tag with the person which we're going to look at now. And just a little uh, a little quiz for later on. You will be quizzed in a few minutes. Cardinal is the name of our platform. Cardinal is a maritime term all around navigation and positioning, uh, which maybe some people did know or maybe they didn't know. It was new to me when I heard it first. But uh, that's where the word cardinal comes from. And you may be quizzed at the end. Okay, so we're on the platform here. Now, the first thing I want to do is the device that I just actually scanned with my uh, mobile app, I want to search for that device and see it on the system. Okay, I've got my Suyo tag. Here we go, 3761. It's now on the platform here, which I could be viewing. I'm viewing here on a laptop, but I could also be viewing um, on an iPad, for example, a ruggedized iPad on a construction site. Um, or an industry site, a heavy industry site, sorry. Then I want to add some additional data. So what this is doing is I'm actually adding context to this tag. I'm going to put a name uh, associated with this tag. I'll put a staff number, I'll put an email, and the phone number. And then I'm going to select a zone where Alice is allowed roam or where she should uh, muster. So that e-mustering application, which I'll show as an example now, me as a worker on the site, I should actually muster in a particular zone. I shouldn't just go to any zone. That's how they kind of um, manage it because there can be 1,500, 2,000 people on these sites and they want to make sure that it's a very efficient and robust process because it's also keeping people safe. So um, once I've done this, I can hit save and now we're going to actually go to our dashboard and we'll see Alice uh, moving around. So again, it came every, all the way from my wrist up to here, moving around on the dashboard. Okay, so this is an example where indoor and outdoor have been used in tandem. So what that means is there would be a single uh, ultra wideband anchor in each of these zones so that we can determine if the person is close to the check-in point, which is in the middle of these zones. And then in the wider space, uh, we, we actually use LoRa 2.4. Uh, so anchors, you know, 500 meters apart, and we needed five to 10 meter accuracy out in the wider space. But once we get into this zone, we want to know very accurately, is that person still there? So, so, I, so Albert, just one, one quick thing. I, I just wanted to focus in on that. You just described two dissimilar technologies coexisting under Cardinal. So you can get the granularity you want for your project whether it's indoor or outdoor, it's a big item or it's a very small expensive item, you can send alerts back and forth. The system will, will take all of this stuff and present it to you on that single Cardinal platform. Yeah, that's right. So it'll hand over from one technology to another <clears throat> based on where it is or based how you want it to be defined. So for example, when we roamed into a zone and the ultra wideband signal, was clearer in the zone as opposed to outside the zone, then the platform would take the ultra wideband information to give that dot on the map. So at any one point in time, you've got one dot on the map or one location for this person. However, they may be using different radios. So it's the ability to manage the handover of those, uh, which is important. Sometimes you'll have a use case where you only need outdoor or you only need indoor, but it's where you kind of cross over both um, where it becomes uh, a bit of a challenge. That answer your question, Pat. Yeah, it does. And I think case in point, historically, mm -hmm. you could use any technology you wanted as long as it was the only one that the supplier supplied. Yeah. And you you had use cases. I remember working in, in big projects where you had passive RFID, active RFID, uh, BLE, and barcode. And effectively, you had four different systems and your screens were all cluttered up and you had to toggle between all of these. And Cardinal has basically put everything together in one screen and it becomes seamless. So whether you're looking at a QR code or an ultra wideband, it doesn't matter. It's all gonna show up 
as that one dot. That's it. And we just said that our dot is actually Alice. So I'm going to search for Alice. We found Alice in her zone. Now we want to do a little bit of replay and understand for the past 24 hours uh, where she has moved. And what we've seen as kind of you know useful is this type of histogram type view. So this is obviously for safety, but we can also understand which zones Alice is working in, which ones she has a permit to work in, and maybe she doesn't have a permit to work in, which ones are dangerous, less dangerous. So for example, we've got our two zones here, parking bay and armature workshop, and we can see for how long in, in which zone uh, Alice actually was in over the past 24 hours, and I think. And I would say to add to that, uh, also, if she hasn't mastered right during evacuation, you still have the last known location as well. So yeah, use that to, you know, of course, send out a rescue team or something like that. Exactly. Right. And the ones in red here that we're looking at, they're the ones that have not mustered. And we've started our muster event. So these are really the, the people that were interested in either sending a message down to their wrist, right, to, to buzz a tag, to send a, to send a noise so that they're alerted. Or we are we obviously go and um, recover these people. So that that's Albert, sort of the, yes. A, a real quick point on that. Uh, you know, Peter and you have been talking about this. Uh, it's important to note that the the tag or badge that we're tracking right now, we're actually tracking a tag number. It's F six two one zero what have you B eight. Uh, it's not saying that that's Pat McGowan. That only becomes visible. In the case of an emergency, let's say uh, that I'm a man down or something happened to me or if we're mustering and there's an odd tag that's out uh, that you could actually, in, the user has the ability to find out who that tag belongs to for emergency services. Let's say I, I'm diabetic and I haven't moved in a while that they would say ABC123 is a man down. He hasn't moved in a while. Who is it now? But the rest of it is, it's anonymous. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And in fact, the personnel data would usually sit on a different system, maybe in the client's IT infrastructure. So it's not mm -hmm. really relevant for us to know who the person is. We can use staff ID or dev uh, the device ID, but uh, when we need that personal information, that's all controlled by the client because it's very important from a GDPR point of view and data security. Right. Um, so we've looked at the commissioning app here on the side. I mean, one thing obviously, which is important, and I think uh, Peter showed as well, the planning tool is being able to just create a zone ad hoc. And then it's not really about being able to just create a zone, but create a, a, a rule. So this is all just the logic that will um, go with our alerts. So for example, I want to know in the safe zone when somebody leaves, and I want to know if they stay outside the safe zone for more than 60 minutes. This is just an example. I want an email sent. Obviously, that can be SMS or maybe a trigger into a third-party system. But that's it's the rules and alerts that build up the logic for that use case. So if it's not email string, if it's pick list, I want to know what's the best route for me. I've got 10 items in this uh, large laydown yard. How, uh, can you navigate me in the most efficient way to get those uh, 10 items? Um, so that's the cardinal demo. Um, I'm keen to leave the uh, channel open for questions, but that's really all the way from scanning a tag using ultra wideband. And when I show the anchor here, you know, it's important to be able to use location to make sure you record where the anchor was commissioned, which can also be done using the Denalso commissioning app. And Suyo themselves, as Peter showed, you have some really nice tools for making sure that your floor plan is ingested uh, and you can see it clearly. And I think that's, uh, I think uh, Albert, uh, just to add to that, I think that's a very powerful demo for a safety application. But, you know, I was just recently talking to a client in the metals industry where they've already tested some technologies, like especially GPS for outdoor tracking, but they're mm -hmm. 
and they have really tall structures and sometimes you have tunnels in there as well and they need to track cards as they move it's a massive area and they need to track cards as they go from you know one stage one production stage to the other one and you know because gps didn't work then they were like okay you know we're lost probably we don't have a way to solve this so they started to use like plastic cones you know to like identify the cards and then like manually search for them which you know if you have an area which is pretty massive, you know, that's that's quite challenging. So, I mean, you know, having this right combination of technologies and having a unified platform where you don't really need or you don't really care, you know, which technology is calculating the position right now. You just, you know, care about, let's say, accuracy of the data and making sure that you know exactly where it is at all times. That's that's very powerful and, you know, can can really help you not just only in these, let's say, safety situations, but also in terms of productivity, because you don't have to rely on just the GPS and know that, hey, you know, as soon as I enter the tunnel, my signal is lost. You know, the mm -hmm. UW can take over from that and you still have a seamless tracking and you don't have to. Uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about any of those restrictions anymore. Absolutely. And we've seen it ourselves, you know, with the use case where it's wide open area and then all of a sudden a lot of metal, very cluttered. So I want to keep someone safe when they're going into the cluttered area and coming out and when they're in the wider area. How do I do that with, you know, with, okay, with one technology, it's not going to work. There's, there's not usually one technology for those types of use cases, you know. And the ubiquity of what we're talking about, I think it's important to note industry-wise, globally, we're going from everything from tracking blood to we're involved in a project right now for a major beer manufacturer to track kegs of beer to working with uh, dispense, uh, you know, applications right now where we're in, uh, you know, with the Department of the Navy, we're talking to them about uh, the maintenance on things to, uh, you know, components and ships and what have you, to working in a mining application to Peter's point where we're outdoor. Now we're going into a tunnel it's five meters by five and a half meters, and we have to track the workers and the equipment to the blast face of the tunnel to make sure that nobody's in an area when they go to hit blast. This is the same technology that is being used across the board. I mean, we're looking for your asset. You tell us what it is. You get to set up the rules. This is all user defined. So yeah. whether we're, you know, from beer to blasting, we're going to be able to track you. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. And I, I see some questions coming in kind of on that point, but maybe one for you, Peter. I see um, Malik, thanks for the question about just, you know, the zero D single anchor. But when, when somebody thinks of a standard warehouse, they might start thinking, well, how many anchors do I have to put out, Peter? So how do they kind of figure that out in their head or roughly understand what sort of infrastructure have, have they to put out to get very high accuracy? Right, right. So you may have seen some of that on the planning tool that I've shown. Um, so, you know, we, we typically combine the location modes, 0D, 1D, and 2D. Um, so, you know, to the question about, you know, 0D, for instance, that will just, let's say, tell you, you know, uh, still using the ultra wideband signal, but it will just tell you if something, you know, is near an anchor, basically. This can be used in, you know, we've used it in projects where we do work in progress. We just need to know that a pallet has entered the stage, but you don't necessarily need to know like up to one foot level of accuracy where in that process it is. Um, then you have 1D where, especially if we have racking, uh, we can eliminate the anchors to like two anchors per individual racking. And then we can tell you how far down, you know, the racking, the forklift or, you know, person uh, is currently, um, which is a huge advantage because, you know, typically you have to deploy many more anchors in like, you know, with some of the other solutions to do that. And then in an open area, we can switch to 2D. So, uh, you know, of course, every... And I like to say this very often, every no plant is identical in this world, even if it's the same company, you know, no two plants will be exactly the same. So we always analyze the layout and cal then calculate the number of anchors. And it again, you can have like a full plant coverage or you can mm -hmm. have just a partial coverage, right? It, it really depends on the process that you're trying to solve. So if there are areas where you don't need tracking, you know, you don't need to cover it at all. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. You know, going back to the mustering use case, uh, you know, if you need to only cover the mustering locations, you can have mm -hmm. that. But if you also want to know where the person's last known location, then, you know, you can have, uh, you know, the coverage also also in there. So it's mainly dictated by, I would say, the business case that we're trying to solve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's not a, there's not a one size fits all for sure. 
And I saw in some examples, some SUEO case studies where you might have islands of infrastructure, like you said, maybe in between these islands, you don't actually need to know the location, you just need to know where in these zones they are. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I think it's time for our quiz. Uh, so MK, if you want to put the poll up, but just while, while we're looking at that, the other things are around um, some frequencies of ultra wideband and LoRa. Um, there's another question in there too. Oh, Malik has a follow up. Okay, great, Malik. Maybe you can get in touch with uh, with Peter afterwards. So it seems like indoor outdoor is becoming um, very prevalent for me. Like automotive manufacturing from the assembly line all the way out to the yard. So in the yard, you've got this, you know, finished asset which may have to sit there amongst thousands of assets that look the same. But from a, from a logistics point of view, I want to obtain certain assets to put onto a loader and out they go. But they may also have been tracked indoors. So those, that indoor outdoor kind of bridge seems to be coming up a lot. You know, and that's a good point, Albert. And we see it uh, automotive manufacturing to construction where they have containers or racks that they may be leasing or renting from the manufacturer. And we see them sitting out in a yard and we find out that nobody's touched them in a while. In the meantime, you're paying for it. So the demerging capabilities of what we're talking about really goes to the bottom line. If you've got a, you know, a 50 foot C can that's sitting out there and you're paying X dollars a day and it's not being used, you'd be able to determine when was the last time, you know, that thing was accessed. Yeah, absolutely. And just um, on the practical point of things, we're talking about infrastructure. We got another question from Nolaney uh, about battery lifetime. So I think it's a similar answer to what Peter was saying there. It really depends on the use case. So for us, you know, you may, if it's an asset, you may only be reporting on movement. And so you may only be reporting a couple of times a day. Obviously, when you're tracking people and it's very important. Um, process, you may be getting uh, uplinks every 30 seconds. So it really, like, it really depends on the use case. You can get uh, battery lives in certain technologies up to uh, two and three years and beyond. Um, if you're tracking every 30 seconds using ultra wideband or something else, your battery will be affected. The way you do, like the way you um, get over that, obviously, is the bigger the tag is, the more battery you can put in there. But I'm sure, Peter, you've been asked that question a few times. Yes, yes, sir. So uh, in terms of, let's say, asset tracking, if you would be talking about ultra wideband technology, you typically have five to seven years on a single charge. Um, that's exactly like Albert says, you know, it really is, uh, you know, how how often you send the data uh, or how often you have the location updates so that affects the battery. And then, of course, typically tax today and it doesn't matter, you know, what technology it is. They have an accelerometer that can detect if the tag is moving or not. And when it's not moving, it goes to sleep. So that way you can, you know, preserve the battery. And typically, if you think of, let's say, tracking of pallets and stuff like that, most of the time, I would say 70 to 80 percent are actually stationary. So, you know, the tag can be put to sleep throughout, you know, that. And then you can get location updates as it gets moving again, basically. So. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, please do follow up and we'll be in touch with people who are interested afterwards. So we did have a couple of people thinking Cardinal was a religious, there was a religious reference. And um, obviously the Cardinals in the Vatican. And We found the Catholics in the crowd. Yeah. And one person thought it was a bird. But most people put in maritime navigation, which is good. And that is where it came from. <laughs> All about finding your way home. So um Thanks a lot, everybody. It was great to have such a good crowd here today. And thanks for the questions. I'd also like to thank Suyo and Peter for being here. I think we got a really good uh, explanation of what Ultra Wideband is doing. It's changing the game for indoor location. Donalto, we're all about the platform. I'm presenting that information and um, we hope to talk to you all again soon. So I don't know if the guys have any closing comments. But... Yep. Thank you very much. And if there's any questions, you can uh, get me directly, pat at donalto.com, albert at albert at donalto.com. And Peter, can you uh, recite your address? Absolutely. You, you can find me on LinkedIn. I would say that's the easiest one. Or you can just also send me an email. It's my first name dot last name at suvio.net. So that's, that's uh, yeah, but LinkedIn would be the easiest, I would say. 
Perfect. Excellent. Thanks again, everybody. And join us for the next one. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.